taken by the devil or undiagnosed mental illness. Stories of possession have been passed down for centuries, but is it possible your favorite horror movie could be more real than imagined? What an excellent day for an exorcism. Exorcisms may have been going on centuries before Jesus came around, but the demon busting he does in the New Testament has proven to be foundational. In Matthew 8, 28-34, he has a hair-raising encounter with two men. They don't directly fight Jesus. Instead, they plead with him to let them take up a herd of nearby pigs. Jesus lets them do just that, upon which the demons cause the whole group of swine to throw themselves into the ocean. The swine herders tell everyone what they just saw, causing a crowd to come meet Jesus and then ask him to leave. Mark 5, 1-17 retells a very similar story, only with even more chilling detail. This time, it's just one possessed man living amongst the graves, though he seemingly manages to approach Jesus on his own. When Jesus asks the spirit's name, it replies in a phrase that may be familiar to pop culture fans. My name is Legion. It's not just modern readers or townsfolk who are unnerved by Jesus' exorcisms. In Matthew 12, 24-32, the Pharisees made the claim that Jesus is so good at casting out demons because he must be in league with them. Jesus stamps that idea out pretty quickly, but it's clear that word of his activities had ruffled feathers. The trouble began in 1632 for the history of the Devils of Loudun. That's when hotshot priest Urbain Grandier rolled into the French town of Loudun. Grandier was intelligent, compelling, and very uncelibate. So when the local nuns began experiencing supernatural activity, the priest's enemies saw an opening. The nuns reportedly levitated, spoke in languages the possessed shouldn't know, and contorted themselves into uncomfortable positions. Soon, their exorcisms became public spectacles. Several nuns worked Grandier into their visions, which detractors used to publicly condemn the priest. Grandier was arrested, tortured, and in August 1634, he was burned at the stake. During his trial, prosecutors presented a pact that had supposedly been made between the priest and which bore the signatures of several big-name demons, including Lucifer himself. Though some believed that the nuns were really possessed, others were far more skeptical. Perhaps the isolated, cloistered nuns had pulled a prank out of boredom. Others have pointed to old-fashioned hysteria or even political ambition. Whatever you may see or hear, keep your eyes forward and don't stop praying. Barbara Lay worked as a servant in the household of Marie Renoir, a local major landowner in what's now Quebec. For Spiritus, a journal of Christian spirituality, it was around 1660 when she began to exhibit symptoms of possession, thrashing, groaning, and hallucinations. Priests had attempted to banish the devils, but they would always return. According to historian Mary Cowan, a local man named Daniel Vui was targeted as a witch who had masterminded Alay's torment. He was executed, but the girl's episodes continued. One evening in October 1662, Renoir had enough. When Alay began exhibiting the symptoms of possession again, the older woman made her way into the servant's room, but she wasn't going in unarmed. Renoir carried a relic that she hoped would get rid of whatever was plaguing Alay human rib bone. It had once belonged to Jean de Berbeuf, a Jesuit priest who had been killed in 1649. Renoir laid the rib on Allais and began questioning the demon. It eventually escaped the girl's mouth, and she was believed to be free. The incident was made all the more remarkable, not just because Renoir had procured a bit of priest in the wilds of colonial Canada, but because she had performed a successful exorcism as a layperson and a woman. The case of George Lukens, also known more colorfully as the Atten Demoniac, all began around 1760. In a letter written to the Bristol Gazette by the Reverend William Robert Wade, Lukens' troubles were said to have started during Christmas of that year. While out with friends, he abruptly fainted. When he came to, Lukens said that he thought he'd been hit by someone. Thereafter, he was plagued by violent convulsions, fits of singing, the desire to insult bystanders, and singing hymns in reverse. Even the mention of God or church was said to be enough to agitate the possessed Lukens. This went on for 18 years, though Lukens managed to become a tailor while being hounded by demons. In 1788, he was subject to an exorcism conducted by Anglican and Methodist ministers, which seemed to finally cure him. Yet while the tale of the Yatin demoniac spread, many readers were not quite so believing. Some said that Lukens was afflicted by epilepsy, while others concluded that he was merely a fraud. In a 1936 issue of Time magazine, an article appeared that told the story of a dramatic exorcism held in Erling, Iowa. A middle-aged woman had been suffering from symptoms of possession for over a decade. When doctors couldn't diagnose her, the local bishop gave the go-ahead for an exorcism. The woman was escorted to a convent where seasoned exorcist Father Theopolis Riesinger conducted the rite. The woman was bound to a bed, but when the exorcism began, she broke away, flew through the air, and ended high up on a wall. When she was pulled down, the woman claimed to be possessed not just by demons, but also by her abusive dead father. 
when she sensed that bully objects were near, the woman screamed and claimed that she was burning. She also suffered physical effects. Her body bloated in response to prayer, and she ejected unspecified effluvia in the priest's direction. <laughs> After a grueling 23 days, the exorcism ended and the woman seemed to be her own person again. Although by some accounts, she suffered from possession again shortly thereafter and continued to receive regular exorcisms for several years. So who was she? While time was coy about naming her, a variety of other accounts identified her as Emma Schmidt, aka Anna Eklund or Mary X. It was the priests at St. Louis University who conducted the exorcism in 1949. According to first-hand accounts, the troubles of the teen known as Roland Doe started in January of that year. He first heard scratching noises from inside his room's walls and floor, while objects nearby moved on their own. The activity intensified until one Lutheran minister told the boy's family to find a Catholic priest. That priest, Father Edward Hughes, eventually asked his archbishop for permission to hold an exorcism. The boy wasn't just screaming and flailing, he was also being physically attacked and bore the scratches to prove it. When one set of scratches spelled out the word Lewis, the boy's family took it as a sign to travel to his mother's hometown of St. Louis, Missouri. Once the priests in St. Louis began the exorcism, it took nearly a month of nighttime rites to banish whatever possessed the boy. He exhibited a number of hallmarks of possession, including an aversion to holy objects and what appeared to be seizures. He even broke a priest's nose, but he never seemed to remember what happened the next day. By mid-April, he was seemingly clear of the force, whether it was ultimately demonic or mental. According to priests, he went on to marry and lead a normal, devil-free life. An August 1949 article published in the Washington Post retold the story, which later inspired author William Peter Blatty to write The Exorcist. The book was adapted into the classic 1973 horror film, the same name. Perhaps the most infamous case of deadly exorcism is that of Annalise Michel, a 23-year-old German woman who died in 1976 after 67 exorcisms. Raised in a conservative Catholic family, Michelle was highly religious and often said that she had to suffer in order to atone for the sins of others. She had been diagnosed with epilepsy when she was 16 and was receiving treatment for the condition. But when Michelle began having hallucinations of demonic faces and disembodied voices, her family sought a religious explanation. Eventually, her behavior grew to include disrobing and barking. She ate spiders and drank her own urine. The Michelles and their priests concluded that she was possessed, and in 1975, the Catholic Church agreed to an exorcism. The two priests who conducted the exorcisms recorded a majority of the sessions. On the tapes, Michelle made animalistic noises and spoke in eerie voices that presented themselves as a bevy of demons and evil historical figures, including Judas Iscariot, Adolf Hitler, and Lucifer. As the sessions continued, Michelle stopped eating and seeing any doctors. She died of starvation, weighing a shocking 68 pounds at her death. The affair did not end with the young woman's demise. German courts went after both the priests and Michelle's parents. They were convicted of negligent homicide, though they all served minimal sentences. Decades later, Annalise's mother, Anna, told The Telegraph that she still believed that her daughter had been possessed by demons and that the exorcism was necessary to save the girl's soul. There's a good reason exorcisms aren't televised. Taking a long entrenched holy rite and throwing it up on a screen for the public to consume in a lurid fashion isn't exactly respectful to the whole affair. Neither is it generally considered acceptable to take a person who is suffering either from the symptoms of mental illness or an infestation of demons and put their pain on display for entertainment. Yet it's clear that not everyone agrees on this front, as evidenced by a 1991 exorcism of a teen girl that was broadcast on ABC's 2020. The girl was pseudonymously known as Gina. Her exorcism was conducted by two priests, a likewise unidentified Father A and Father James LeBar, a consultant on cults for the Archdiocese of New York. Gina was tied to a chair where she thrashed and snarled sometimes incoherent nonsense. Gina's mother had reportedly been led to believe that exorcism was the next step after more medically approved psychiatric treatment didn't alleviate her daughter's disturbed mental state. But though the priests involved believed that this sort of spiritual infestation needed to be shown to the masses, others wondered if the slickly produced episode was exploited. There were rumors that Gina's immigrant mother was pressured into participating by church officials, while it was unclear if Gina herself understood her torment was being broadcast to the nation. Though exorcism may be deeply old-fashioned, that doesn't mean the rite isn't performed well into the modern day. And while some exorcisms can seem almost casual, like those performed over the phone for Reuters, others can become so intensely personal and physical that lives are lost. 
Such was the tragic case of Romanian Orthodox nun Maricica Irina Cornici, who died in 2005 after an agonizing exorcism. At first, as CBS News reported, Cornici appeared to be suffering from schizophrenia. As psychiatrist Gheorghe Silvestrovici told the outlet, she first sought help in April 2005 after she began hearing voices. Doctors told her that this was a schizophrenic hallucination, but it was difficult for Cornici to shake the idea that it was actually the devil telling her that she was full of sin. She was sent to the Holy Trinity Convent in Tanaku with the plan that she would soon be under medical supervision again. She would never return. The convent's priest, Daniel Petro Protegianu, quickly moved to exercise Cornici. He later told the court that she had become violent and had to be restrained, while she also refused food and drink. Where a hospital might introduce a feeding regimen and round-the-clock supervision, Corajanu and the convent's nuns left Cornici alone and without sustenance. She eventually died due to dehydration and suffocation from a gag placed on her face. Corajanu and four nuns were charged and jailed for her death. 